Welcome to the passion of entrepreneurship. I'm Ravi Tangri, and every weekday in June, I am interviewing a different entrepreneur to really find out what it is that drives them, that really pushes them to take that chance, take that risk on themselves, and find out what how they get through all the challenges that they do. So every weekday in June, at this time, it's 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern time, and five o'clock in the UK, I'll be bringing you uh, an amazing interview with an incredible entrepreneur. And it is my absolute pleasure today to bring you a dear friend, Dana Ferrand, who is uh, now a fellow speaker and coach and and but she also built a seven figure business before she even moved into this with her spa and such and so i would say dana you you would qualify to be a serial entrepreneur would that fit <laughs> i that always sounds really bad serial <laughs> entrepreneur, you know <laughs> like i'm killing businesses <laughs> when then oh i, I think that's a good <laughs> But you, you love a serial entrepreneur to me is a creator. You love creating things, but then maybe at a certain point, okay, I need to create more, but businesses get to a steady state and it's not as much fun. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. There's, you know, the, the serial entrepreneur loves the startup, the challenge, the, the thrill, you know, we are like the, the passion seekers, but also like those, um, the extreme sport, you know, we, we <laughs> like the extreme of it. That's really, you know, cause if it's just about money, go buy a business that's already thriving and keep it running. Right. So tell me for you, how did your entrepreneurship journey start? You know, how, how, when did you first start getting that bug that I need to follow that calling, follow that in me to create? Yeah, I, I would say probably like first job. And um, so I graduated high school at 17 and I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was like, ah, you know, so I actually went and worked at McDonald's full time for a year, which was the best thing for me that I ever could have done. And the main thing it, it gave me was the, a sense of I'm not a good employee. I really. <laughs> <laughs> so why are you not a good employee? Because I have to run the joint. It's, <laughs> and that doesn't work, you know, when you're like a 17 year old pup and this, you know, the managers are like, uh, you don't really know what you're doing. I'm like, yeah, but I need to be the boss. You don't understand. So I, I would say that really re reinforced it. That in the, uh, my summer, my first summer job, I told my first boss to where to stick it. Um, but that, <laughs> that isn't great for job security. It's not. It's really not. So I, I really am a bad employee. I will work crazy hours for myself. I'm, I'm the worst jo uh, boss because I'm a slave driver. And um, and then when I'm working for somebody else, I'm I'm there at like five o'clock, waiting, punching out. Um, I just don't have the drive to work for somebody else. <laughs> so is it right after that 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 McDonald's experience that you actually started the business? Uh, well, I went to college first, so I uh, became a massage therapist. So I, you know, that gave me an idea of like, okay, where, what path do I want to want to follow? While I was there, I started. I actually went first of all for computer programming, of all things. It's kind of crazy. Um, <laughs> computer programming, pretty close, right? Yeah. You know, so. Um, but not being able to to get that done in time, I, I really wanted to do systems analyst, but at that time you had to do programming first and it was just like, oh, this is crazy. So then I got a part-time job at the massage college as the receptionist and got trained and I was getting massage and I was, you know, talking with the students and I thought, this fits me way better. Like I have flexible hours, I can make, you know, I get to dictate what I make. I, be my own boss at that time I was I had this idea of going to work on cruise ships um until all the things happened about you know all of the the rapes and things that were happening at the cruise ships back in the early 90s I was like mm, maybe not <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll skip that one <laughs> you know? so it was that that really drove me to to pick my career was also partially based on the fact that who am I who what do I want to do I want to work for myself I want to have that that ability um sure. So let me slow you down a bit. That that journey of figuring out who am I, what do I want to do, 
can you slow down a little bit of that? Sure. What you went through in that? I'm curious what how you discovered that. What do you want to know more about? Help me out. Uh, that that process of discovering yourself of what how you got that aha that I have to do something that's mine. Um, I, I think, well, first of all, like I said, like I, I recognize I'm not a good employee. Um, yeah. Every job that I'd been in, I really, you know, it was like, I just couldn't really put in the effort. I, I was always considered a good employee, but I never felt like I was a good employee. Yeah. Um, because I knew, I knew how much more I was able to give. And I knew that I wasn't, I knew I was a slacker. Um, I would always look for the short, this is terrible, right? Like, <laughs> here's the thing. They're honest. Yeah, exactly. If you can't be a good employee, then go run your own job. Um, not necessarily the criteria, but I think for me, um, noticing that I like to problem solve. I I like looking at what was happening. I mean, when I was working at McDonald's, I was really fascinating with fascinated with their systems and the flow. And I like that was, you know, here I am. 16 They're phenomenal years. for that, aren't they? They are crazy phenomenal for this. So it was amazing training. Like it really got my brain in gear um, to look at those pieces. And then, like I said, when I was evaluating the massage, the the piece of being able to travel, um, go and work different places in the world was very appealing to me. Um, I loved the idea of helping people. I, you know, people had always told me that I have healing hands, that I have a natural gift with people. And, you know, all through high school, I was the, the optional guidance counselor. Um, if you didn't want to go to the guidance counselor, you, you know, go and seek me out okay. at lunch and we'd have a talk. And so you started seeing a gift that early. I did. I did. I was, I was always the one sought out. Everybody was, you know, they'd come to me with all their problems. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, by the end of lunch, they're like, Oh, I feel better. I'm like, Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I did, but okay. So I really did see some of those gifts and I saw how that was going to fit in with the massage aspect because even though it's hands-on, it's um I also could see very early on that there's a very strong component between the connection between um the emotions and the body and what's going on emotionally shows up physically. Right. Totally. Which was a big part of why I was so successful was because I recognized that. Okay. But uh, coming back to the decision making, um, I think it just it, it started ticking all the boxes. Um, and so I went for it. I, I went and did signed up for the course. So, OK. And the, but then again, a lot of people go to train in massage therapy, but they don't start their own business. You did you actually go out right from there to. Um, at that at the time that I graduated, there were not any places where you could go and get a job. Like there are actual job places now. So I knew going out that I was going to be self-employed, even if it was a matter of I was renting space or commissioned or you know, paying a split. Right. There were there were no other options when I graduated. Um mm -hmm. so I went and I looked out, I looked for a few different places. Um <laughs> I did have I did have one sort of pseudo job for a little bit. I went and worked at a, a physician's place and he was billing. I think it was a little shady. I don't know. He was he was billing under OHIP and and, and it was in Keswick. I, you don't know Keswick, but um in this in this part of the world at that time, Keswick was uh noted for being the domestic violence capital of the world or of Canada. Wow. Yeah, so it wasn't the greatest <laughs> reputation at that time. Um, so here I was doing these little 15 minute massages and uh, it was just, that was kind of gross. Um, so I, I hunted around for a place that was really going to work and I lucked out. I found, um, I found a location that was actually in two locations, but the same two women were running it. So one ran the one location, one ran the other. They were both very established and they were willing to mentor. And so I got their overflow plus all the work that, that I did to generate clients. So within six months of, of joining the two of them, I had a wait list, which was quite phenomenal for, well, it still is phenomenal for the massage industry. <laughs> right. So then how did you branch out for yourself in your own spa? Um, so eventually I moved locations and, um, and then opened up, you know, my own place. Um, so let me think about the timeline there. So I, oh, 
<laughs> a little more disclosure. Yeah. So the one place I was working at, I pissed off the chiropractor who owned the space and, uh, and the massage therapists were subletting to me. And so him and I came to, came to heads and he, he wanted me out. So <laughs> there's a good, uh, good right? incentive to start something new. I'm like, okay, it's time to, it's time to do something else. So there wasn't room for me to go full time at the other location. Um, so that prompted me to say, okay, well, you know what, now it's time. It's time to take up my own place. So I ended up finding a house uh, that I could convert the main level into a clinic space for me and then live above. So it was kind of funny. Here I am, this single woman, I'm living in this giant, like, I don't know, I think it was a 2,500 square foot old house, but it was just a perfect setup because the front would would lend itself perfectly for, for a clinic and it was gorgeous. Um, so I had way too much space, but, you know, cost wise, it made more sense to do that yes. than trying to, to, you know, to rent us a commercial space. Totally. And so you just started on your own, but you built up quite a practice. Yeah. So I, I was just on my own there and um, and then gradually, you know, built that up, moved into another commercial space, brought in some other people with me. Then we, then I moved towns. I, I f thought I fell in love and uh, <laughs> since discovered something different. And we moved up to Barry. Um, so I was in Aurora at that time, moved up to Barry. It's about uh, it's about a 45 minute drive. So I had a couple people follow me and most of them. Yeah. So I started over again and, and then, you know, did the same thing, just started built up my practice, got the connections with the doctors. And then, you know, after a bit of time, I was like, okay, I can't be in with this clinic that I was in with because I'm not running it because I'm not the boss. I don't get to set all the rules. And um, so I, I, you know, got a space and then gradually, you know, just kept adding on. I, you know, brought in other therapists, um, came across an opportunity to um, add on the supplies aspect to it because I had a, you know a small space so we started with a little boutique kind of you know spa shop and um, and then gradually we just we just kept expanding it and expanding it and you know so you've had to build up a couple of times from scratch mm -hmm. yeah and, uh, <laughs> and to you does that it doesn't sound that that like that brings a lot of anxiety whereas for a lot of people that does sometimes create anxiety if they've got to start over you know it to some degree yes like there's always the the financial crunch is like okay how do you how do you do it but there's even still a thrill with that this is why i say it's like people like me are you know extreme sport with this in that you know i'm like all right so we got this tiny little budget and we need to do all of this and how do we do it you know i remember that that first location in Barry that we were we were painting and the painter was like I, I was like you got to make that paint work like I can't afford another gallery like but that's it like that's the end of my budget like that's it and he's like just wringing that thing out getting the every last drop of paint to, to be able to paint that space for me yeah. okay so how did you find that transition when you started having a team versus it's all your you what was that transition like for you? That that gets that's where it really gets challenging, um, especially with the clinics. Like for the store aspect of it, not so much because you know I had to hire people, so they were employees. And um, but the clinic, that's all contract people, um, and so we had a real mix of of personalities and you know situations and what they felt they were entitled to and you know, what they, <laughs> what they thought was too much rent to pay and all of these things. So it was, there was a lot of navigating. Some things went well and some things were a little messy. I, I will admit it. There were some ugly things that happened. Uh, <laughs> so. But it sounds like that's not as much of a passion piece for you as when you're creating the new, because I hear a lot more energy in your voice mm. when you're talking about those times when you're building and creating. I know. I love. I love the challenge of trying to create something out of nothing, or you know, make it make it work. Even when I'm working with clients, I still find that thing of like, all right, so they're completely resistant to that. So let me think of another way in there. I'm okay. gonna get 
subconscious brain on board. I'm like, you know, I love a good challenge. I really do. So what was it in the end? Like, you, you know, you built a seven figure business with the spa, right? Mm -hmm. So what was it that made you say, okay, I'm walking away from that? You know, uh, th that was really fun in that. Um, so I remember August 2016, I'm sitting out with a friend of mine who is also a coach. And, you know, I've been complaining about the fact that, you know, once again, I'm taking my coaching money and I'm putting it in the store. And then I'm like, mm -hmm, right. You, so know. you started coaching back then. Yeah. So yeah. I was, I was part-time coaching while I still had the store. I was, you know, kind of getting that, that going. And really th through my massage work, I was it was really coaching done at a super cheap price and you get a massage at the same time. Like it was ridiculous. Um, <laughs> you know, it was a ridiculous good deal. Um, so we're sitting there and we're talking and, you know, and, and my friends over the years had heard me like, Oh, I hate the store. I'm selling it. And then like, and then a big sale come in and go, Oh, I'm keeping the store. <laughs> you know, like, I, a friend of mine actually got me a t-shirt that says um, I'm selling the store and on the back. It says I'm keeping the store because I flip flop so many times. So anyway, back to my story. Um, so my friend and I, sorry about that. My friend and I are sitting in the backyard and I'm complaining about the store once again. And, uh, and she says to me, says, okay, let's talk about this. What does that give you? What does the store give you? Like, and we drill down, you know, drilling down, drilling down, drilling down. And really at the crux of it was status. It was the status of having the store, you know, this piece, this thing, bricks and mortar. I can point to it and go, oh, I own that, right? <laughs> Whatever oh, that means, right? So in doing that, in actually like getting honest with the fact that that's what it was, then she was able to like, you know, stick it to me and go, okay, so you're paying $2,000 a month for status. <laughs> I love it. Oh my god, that's ugly. It's really ugly. Can we can get a talk about truth. it? Yeah. It's you know, it's really it's good to look at them. And this is the thing, right? Is you know, when when we look from the outside, you can see that kind of thing. Now, it wasn't two thousand dollars every month I was putting in, but in the summer I always had to supplement it because that was our slow yeah. season. But it was effectively that. It was effectively that. I mean, that was that was what was keeping me. So we made a decision. Well, we I made a decision in that moment that um, she made me pick a date. And I said, OK, January 1st, it's either sold or I close it one or the other. And um, and then I went and I listed it. And within I think it was like four days, I had a buyer. Wow. Yeah, I actually had I had four lined up, but I had four or one that I picked, and we started hammering out in a deal, negotiating, getting everything in place. And January first, she was the new owner. Wow! All right, so it was time. It was time. That was the universe line for me. So one thing that we should sort of clarify, because I know people that don't know you, and know, don't know your story in, in your bio, just in case they're wondering, because it talks about your time as dominatrix and yeah. that, that was a business too, correct? Um, it was more personal than a business. I did okay. enough pro work to know that, that I don't want to do that. Um, it yeah. looked really good because the money looks really good, but it's a lot of work yeah. it, and there's a whole lot of the, the things with it. So but just yeah. for clarification, because you ran, uh, you know, you started out as a massage therapist and you created a spa, the dominatrix had nothing to do with doing sex. No. <laughs> they were no it was not about sex it is not about sex it's about transformation um and it was completely separate from everything that i was doing in in my businesses um in the massage and the and the massage store so 2006 to 2012 was my time in that world and it changed who i was it changed how i showed up and it changed um how what I brought to my business when I eventually realized that I needed to bring all of those skills into running the store. So what um, did it bring hmm. to your, into your business? What how did it change you? Uh, you know, there's an interesting piece in that when you step into the dungeon, um, you can't fake it. This is not pretending. No one is going to submit to you if you're like, oh, I'm going to pretend to be dominant. Like, no, they can smell that. It's like dogs can smell fear. Submissives can smell if you're not serious. If you're not really going to hold it, it's not going to happen. Um, so you had to actually own it. You had to become this person who was willing to hold the power, 
hold that presence for the other person and and really you know take charge and be in control in a way that is um, high level service. It's about getting them the outcome that has been pre-negotiated. So everything is of course safe, sane, and consensual. And it's all pre-negotiated as to you know what the parameters are. And then you have you have a, a you know rough idea of where you want the scene to go. So in doing that, in holding that space, in being that person, um, it changes, it changes who who you are at a DNA level. And then that translating into my business, there's a, there's, I say leadership is probably the biggest thing because I'm willing to hold people accountable when I wasn't before. I'm willing to make people uncomfortable for the sake of the greater good of where we're going. And these are, you know, really skills that every business owner needs. So what did other people say about you and what they saw change in you? How, what was the feedback you got from others in that time? Hmm. I think actually people were too afraid to say anything. Um, <laughs> I don't remember any feedback necessarily. I mean, um, I did, I did have one friend who was really quite offended by the whole thing. And, and um, she was, she was very put off by it. She just, like we, it it was the beginning of the end of our friendship. I'm sure. Or, or I just meant about feedback about the shift in your behavior. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure anyone ever really said anything. Mm -hmm. I, I know there's a lot of other things that I've done where people have given me that feedback. Um, yeah. Okay. So, but even in that, that theme of, you know, because you said that it's it's about helping. It's about transformation. You're helping motivation came through in that mm -hmm. there's motivation the confidence um <clears throat> trusting in yourself yeah being willing to and i i talk about this being willing to be the expert because too often we defer out to somebody else i think that's one of the things that in in that space in the dungeon there isn't anybody else you can't defer and you can't let the submissive think that you're not in charge that right to figure it out. I mean, you're you're aware and you're adapting and you're you're being present and focused. Um, so really, uh, how how could it not change me? I think I think I just didn't get necessarily outward feedback from people, but definitely there's confidence. My my husband jokes that you know I will send him confidently in the wrong direction. <laughs> okay. He won't take directions from me if we're driving. Yeah. Because I'm like, we need to go left. And then we get start going left, and I'm like, oh shit, we needed to go right. <laughs> but you were sure about the left. I'm just, I'm so definite when I say it that it sounds like I'm really confident with it. Because if I'm going to say something, I'm going to own it. I'm just going to like dive right in. <laughs> okay. If you're going to go, go all the way. Right. So, what, what I love is that in the time since then, as you've built your business, uh, you've taken that. And the learnings from that uh, being a dominatrix into your coaching and into your speaking to to really help people transform their own lives. Tell me a bit about how you saw those connections, were able to take it and move it from one arena to the other. Mm -hmm. um, so I first of all played with this energy, you know, of the dominatrix in my own business and really noticed that in the in this the supply outlet business i noticed that when i would bring that energy of the dominatrix in um sales would go up it was easier to upsell people people were happier with the service that they got and and if i let it slide sales would drop and wow. yeah it was Light and, day, light and day. It was like light bulb on off it really was it was so dramatic so that confidence that assuredness yeah. Shifted the bottom line. Yeah. Well, I mean, you think about it in sales. So if somebody walks into the store and let's say they've come in for, um, you know, a gallon of oil and, and I get talking with them. I'm like, all right, what else is going on in your business? And where the, and, and then when they're, when I see 
a situation where it's like, you know what, hey, have you ever thought about this? And I'll show them another product. And because I'm like excited and I'm confident about it, then they're like, oh yeah, let me let me bring that on board and start, you know, selling it or you know, start using that. And and then they're they come back the next time that they're thanking me for that recommendation because it did work. I mean, I'm listening, I'm still using all the same tools of I'm listening for where can I help them, but because I present with that you know, I'm willing to stand behind it and really be confident in it, then they lean in and say yes, as opposed to, oh, let me think about it. So there's a, there's a couple of things I'm hearing there that are key, because a lot of times in that situation, when people are selling, they're selling, and part of the motivation is they're going to get that commission. Yeah. And it's more about them than about you. What you are saying is that underlying this is the helping them and that confidence in them, which is focused on them, yeah, which is what they read. Yeah, and that's that's where it translates from the dominatrix world is that, you know, although it looks like I'm the one in charge and deciding where things are going and how they're going, I'm always aware of what that person needs, what is going on with them, always aware. And so that same thing in all of our businesses, if you are always thinking about what is in the best interest of the client, your business can't help but do better. Okay, so what else have you found translates from that arena, from the dungeon into the business world? Ooh, I love the topic of negotiations. That's been my my latest theme to be digging in on, because um, negotiating is a skill set for sure. It's you know we we negotiate prior to any kind of scene. Um, and it's different. It's different from, you know, what a lot of people would think about negotiating, but it's, it's, again, it's that discussion. It's being able to pull out more information from them. Um, because of course you're, you're in the dungeon world, you're talking about things that people are kind of, they want to explore, but they're really uncomfortable. And so you, you got to make them comfortable. You've got to get them on the side. You've got to pull out all that information that you need in order to keep them safe. Now, negotiation also goes a little bit further than that, but I get I get a thrill out of um, negotiating and helping people to get more than they thought they were going to, or you know, really encouraging them to lean into something. Like I just have a woman right now, it's so much fun. So she is um, getting a refund for a program that was marked non-refundable, but because the program is not being delivered as is you know, outlined in the contract, we have a loophole. And she was not going to ask for that money. And I got talking with her. She's like, oh, but it says non-refundable. And she's like, oh. And I'm like, no, here, here's what we're going to lean into. You know, and I'm not giving legal advice. Let's get that clear. Um, but I'm giving her advice on how to word the negotiation so that she gets the outcome that she wants. And so I'm, we're just waiting to, uh, waiting to hear back the final stage. Um, so I think we're about a week and a half and she'll get her money, which is a huge chunk of money. Excellent. And that's, yeah, that's things that changed because of the whole COVID situation and such as. Yeah. yeah well, it's a, it's a situation where, uh, yeah, because of COVID they're not delivering. And once something is not delivered, it changes the terms of the contract. So as soon as the terms of the contract are changed, then all of the terms of the contract are open for being null and void. Now, again, that's like consult a lawyer for to get actual legal advice, but yeah. In my studies, this is the piece that you can lean into. And there's a lot of situations, especially if you've paid something by credit card, it's a, it's actually quite easy to get a refund. And most people don't think about it, but there are steps that you need to take. And there are things that you need to avoid saying, otherwise you could screw yourself out of that refund. Okay. So I'm hearing some very clear themes coming through for you. The helping okay. certainly is really important being focused on the person you're working with the customer the client whoever mm -hmm. that's it, that comes through implicitly in everything that you're you're saying is what's best for them which is going to get you what you need as well yeah. surprisingly if you focus on that <laughs> right? yes and also uh something that's been important to you is is and uh, is that the control that you want to be running the show yes right? <laughs> now you've been through having to start over a couple of times right now 
with the situation that's going on, uh, you know, a lot of people have been shaken up. Businesses had disrupted. Uh, the way of doing business has gone poof, mm -hmm. right? And there are probably a lot of entrepreneurs who are trying to figure out how to go forward. And the, the challenge with the entrepreneur, uh, as opposed to a J-O-B, is uh, the buck stops with you. Yeah. Right. Uh, and ironically, that gives you more control because if you've got a job, all that happens is one day you you suddenly get an email saying it's done. Right. You, there's no control, yeah. but it can be terrifying for some. So what would you say to people now who entrepreneurs now who are dealing with all of this uncertainty, dealing with how do I move forward the way I've done it? I can't do it anymore. Uh, you know, there's, there's some government support perhaps, but it's not going to be forever for, for everything. So what would you suggest to people or perhaps people you've already been working with in your coaching practice about how to move forward in this uncertainty that to me also opens up potential? You know, it's interesting. And I know you and I do similar work in that, you know, being able to shift the inner mindset, the inner beliefs that those core pieces and when those, when the, when the reactions, when the emotions are taken out of the situation, you have a greater capacity to think. So, you know, we, I, and I always do this analogy that your, your brain is like a computer, you know, the RAM in your computer, the higher your emotional state in the computer, the lower your cognitive processing. So when we bring the emotions down, we can bring the cognitive functioning up and be able to think creatively. And that's what we need. We need to be able to think creative. So we have to get out of our way. And, um, and I do find it's really helpful to be, you know, con getting other people on board with giving us the, that feedback, giving that, you know, outside perspective of ideas. I love brainstorming with people. Um, again, you know, my, my systems analyst brain is, is always in creative mode of how do we work around it? How do we take the skills and the strengths of what you currently have and move them into something new or a new way to do it or a new approach or, you know, constantly tweaking and adjusting with what's going on. Well, that's, uh, yeah, I, another theme too that came out because you said that when it came time to finally let go of your business, you consulted with a, a friend who mm. was honest with you, brutally so perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah takes that right we need the 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 real truth pussyfooting around it doesn't always work yeah because uh, but that's exactly what you've said here about consulting others reaching out whereas normally when people go into the fear in this they tend to close in mm -hmm. and push people away so any thoughts about that in terms of how they can get past that response to be able to reach out because I think I think part of it is people don't want to say that they failed and they feel they failed even if it's not their doing right but how do they push past all of that um it's it's a bit of a loop right because it once you reach out then it's a lot easier to to have the help to push past these pieces so i mean for me i tend to work with people who have already achieved multiple six figures or above and they have they've already experienced a little bit of that so they can kind of lean on um you know where have i done that in the past where have i leaned in even though it was uncomfortable even though i was afraid and and it turned out well and you can kind of pull on that memory if you've never had that memory maybe think of you know when have you done that in your personal life when have you leaned in asked for help and it worked um, because a lot of times what happens is we get thinking about all the times that we failed and um, and I don't like to look at failure as failure like there's to me there's no such thing as failure no. um, it's, learning. Just, it's learning and every single quote unquote failure has led me to something even better. Um, so that that to me is why there is no such thing as failure. They, they always turn out for the best, but we have to kind of sometimes remind ourselves 
of when that worked in the past, when that was true, and then then we can lean in. Because without that, we're not necessarily going to choose to lean into that discomfort. Okay. And you know, you say you work with people that are six figures or above. You usually don't get there without having quote unquote failed. Oh yeah. Before <laughs> at least once. <laughs> You're gonna fail 50, 60, 100 times getting to your first six figures, if not more. Yeah. Um, and then you're going to continue to fail. And, and that's, you know, that's never going to stop. But shifting it around just to realizing that, oh, okay, what is that? What has that failure allowed me to do? What is the gift in it? Okay. That's, a, that's wonderful. And uh, this has just come to me. I hope you'll pardon me, but I think you, you feel okay. Right <laughs> now, uh, with what's happening starting in the states but it's going worldwide this this mm -hmm. this focus on black lives matter but the it's there's the urgency about the injustices with police and the, the biases there there's also a deeper um issue of racism and privilege mm -hmm. and one of the challenges i think you know people who are not of color just do not see the things that we do day after day after day, right? Yeah. And and there, there needs to be communication, there needs to be understanding. Any thoughts from your perspective on how um, people can open to what's invisible to them to be able to start, you know, you can't yeah. know it, but you could at least empathize or understand to start to bridge the gap. Any thoughts on that? I, You know, I love that you've asked this question because you know, I've seen lots of people posting saying we need to do better. And that's almost like spiritual bypassing. It's like, oh, we need to do better. What does that mean? Um, so I love this discussion. It, when we open up to hearing other people, like I, I read a post um, by a woman and, and she was saying, oh, you know, I wonder if this is what black people feel like. And she's a white woman. And she talked about, you know, feeling unsafe on the street with her, you know, pushing her toddler in a certain situation. And then there was a woman who is of color and she posted, she's like, um, bless your heart, but no. And, and then she went in and she said, this is what it's like. And she went into, you know, detail of like day to day little things. Uh -huh. And I think us opening up to hearing the stories from other people. What is it like for you? I can't ever know what it's like, but tell me, tell me your story so that I can understand. And I think the other really big thing from where I sit is that if we as individuals work on healing our own wounds, traumas, and the epigenetic pieces, the lineage, um, we will open up a space for being able to hear other people. And I think one of the things for, you know, because I'm a white woman, um, if you can tell, <laughs> you know, it's um, I'm in a place of privilege, even though as a woman I've been repressed to a degree, but I'm really, really in a place of privilege over colored. It, and it's, you know, for me to try to understand that it, I can't, I can't ever put myself there. But the more I heal my trauma, the less I need to make it about me and the more I can hold space to hear other people's stories. I and to, right, to actually embrace that and say, I don't know what you've been through, but I can love you and hear you. And right. that is one thing I can do. So instead of reacting to it because of your own stuff, you can truly, as you say, hold space and be present to, to really hear. Yeah. Yeah, I think this piece of like, I don't need to talk about the things that I've been through in order to like to say, oh, I understand. I, you know, I think I think that's really it's always a bad thing to do with people. You know, if if we have healed our own trauma, we don't need to talk about it when we're holding space for other people. True. True. That's wonderful. Thank you, Dana. Thank you for asking that. It's a very timely. I'm glad I did. Now. If people are looking to get in touch with you, I believe your website is the best uh, best place to find more about you and all the work that you do. Thank you. Yeah, DanaFerrant.com. Uh, I'm the only Dana Ferrant in the world so far, so I'm pretty easy to find through all the channels. 
That's wonderful. And we'll be continuing this tomorrow uh, with Rhonda Scarf, who has built an amazing business in an area people said can't be done, not possible. You cannot be successful in that arena. So we're going to dive into what enabled that. And also, if you are an entrepreneur, what I'm, I'd like to get your help on is I'm doing over this week uh, a study, a thought exchange on what do we need to get through this crisis and beyond. It's a very simple survey to answer that question. But the cool thing about thought exchange is that when after you answer it, your answers are anonymously put into the pool of all the other answers. And then you get to see some of the other answers and rate them on how important they are to you. So in that way, we get to see for entrepreneurs across the board what is most important to thrive at, to move forward. And I will put the link to that survey uh, in the comments here. I would really appreciate it if you could take a few minutes and go and complete that because that's uh, there's going to be... I think some amazing data coming out of that. And you can, there's information there on how you can get the report for free as well if you uh, complete that. So just uh, check in the comments, you'll find the link. So thank you so much, Dana. It is always a pleasure. It's been too, too long. Yes, it has. We'll have to do a few more of these once I get past my June one a day. <laughs> this has Thank been absolutely you. delight. It's let me find out a lot more about you as in, and your journey as well. Thank you so much, Ravi. You are such a gift. Thank you. And uh, to all of you, thank you for tuning in. And we will see you tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat channel. We'll see you then. Thanks. Bye-bye.